how does design impact construction site safety? And can everyone hear okay without the microphone? Okay. So, and whoever wants to start off. I mean, th I, there's a, a number of different viewpoints how you can address this question. So I'm, I'm just going to take it one way that uh, we're really pressing uh, as far as in our company. And uh, I alluded a little bit when I first gave my introduction, and that is basically be ready to be on the job site. You know, you don't go out, um, like Brad just said, with, with your shiny shoes and, and, uh, and think that you're just going to run out quick, take a few photographs, because things happen, you know? And, and we, um, so we're making sure, we're trying to make sure as much as possible that every single project we work on, we have a project-specific safety plan in place in which we review before any of our people are on that job site. Um, it sounds pretty common sense, but um, it, like Kelly said, some of the PMs, they, they just think, oh, just go out and do this quick. Nothing's going to happen, just go out quick and uh, take care of this or do this and do that. But th that's, that's just, uh, we're looking for a problem. And, and it, does, it not only puts our people at a risk, it also puts you know, all the contractors people at risk too, or the people in that vicinity. So make sure that the safety plan is in place, and then conduct a job briefing and, or a job site safety meeting. They're all the same thing, but basically you gather up, um, at least with the superintendent, the foreman, on our railroad projects, we also have the flagger involved, typically, and, and have that discussion of, you know, what am I doing, what are the hazards, um, you know, what's my protection if I'm the railroad, and just, you know, be aware of all the hazards. And then, you know, conduct your business, check back out, and always kind of have your head on the swivel. There's, there's a common theme, or one of the themes that we're saying, it's called the three C's. Always communicate, you know, make sure you understand what everyone's doing and they understand what you're doing. Consistency, if you consistently do, you know, what you're supposed to do and consistently, uh, you know, carry yourself and take care of business the way, it's just going to help everyone do their job easier. And then the third one is common sense. And, you know, a lot of times we say common sense isn't common, is it? So, but, you know, if you see something, you know, say something. Um, typically, uh, you know, to the superintendent or someone in charge, but, you know, we're all out there. We're, we all want to do what we need to do and go home at night one piece. <clears throat> Probably the, the worst accident we had involved an engineer was uh, we were building a hay tanker and uh, there were electrical control room and uh, mechanical rooms and the paint hanger was a downflow paint booth, which has uh, tunnels underneath the floor. And those go underneath into the underside of a bag house. And they pull them up through there to take all the excess paints out of them. And uh, <coughs> the uh, contractor had removed a section of grading to get work get down and do some work in the pit. And one of our engineers walked into the room, went and turned the lights on. There was no lights electrified yet, and stepped into that and fell eight feet down into the hole and was severely injured. Uh, he should have shouldn't have went in a space that was dark. The contractor should not have left a grate open. But it was, and that's usually what happens when an accident happens. It's not usually one thing. It's usually a bunch of things going wrong at the same time. He should have known better than to go into a room that was dark. And luckily, it took him about a year to rehab. He, hit his, he had hit his head on the concrete blow and survived, but it took a year of physical uh, 
rehab and, and months of surgeries. So, yeah, it's, it is important to us to design professionals. We can't be stupid about things. The common sense, you know, don't go into a place that's dark. And I've seen this a million times where guys go into confined spaces without proper uh, equipment. You know, we're engineers. Yeah, we're out doing some inspection, but still, we've got to play by the rules and make sure we're tethered and the air is fine and stuff. But especially on projects that involve industrial, there's lots of confined spaces. And that's our biggest problem with young engineers going into spaces that, you know, look fine, but. Uh, probably one of the big things we tack we're trying to tackle now is with our staff that travel remote, again, North Dakota, Montana, they're driving, commuting, you know, commuting long distances out to each site. And it's, how does the supervisor communicate with them? You know, how do we know when they made it to the job? How do we know when they made it back to the hotel? I mean, we have surveyors; they'll go out by themselves, and some of those areas they fall down and break their leg. We won't know until the wife starts calling, asking where they are. So we're trying to instill that in the PMs and our field guys. You know, we're not checking up on you. We don't care. We're not, you're not going to get in trouble if you're at the job site 10 minutes late. It's, we want to know you're actually physically there and you're all right. And we worked on some different things we were looking at, maybe the apps and things that we could install. The other problem is some of those like locations, there's no towers anywhere so it's so how do we so the biggest one right now is let us know when you get there or they'll know when they're about to get out of service let us know and then let us know when you get back to the hotel other thing is with the site action plans we make sure they know where the nearest hospital is and just emergency numbers uh, if i got there we'd said people they wouldn't have a clue where the nearest hospital was. They might be there with themselves or they might have one other guy with them. So that exposes you to all kinds of risk if something happens. And bad publicity. You know. You all look at the news. As design professionals and engineers, when you're designing elements of a project, how much thought is put into what kind of safety environment that creates for the people that are going to be building the project? That's a good question, and, and like Brad said, that was kind of one of our questions that we had already okay. pre-prepared, but it, it's also a tough one because um, I, I, I work on a lot of linear transportation projects. Um, some facilities and some yards and things like that too, but uh, I, I was thinking about that and, and I think it's something that um, we need to look at in terms of you know construction phasing, constructability, all that going into it to, to make it more streamlined. Basically, how can we build the majority of this project separate from the hazards and, and in transportation projects, that's that's the vehicles who are operating on it, whether it's automobiles, trucks, trains, whatever. You know, trying to put it, set it up so the majority of your work is separated from, you know, and, and phase the construction, you know, phase that traffic around or, or um, you know, those type of controls. Um, I, you know, just looking at that question, it's a great question and, and it's, Probably one that I'll still continue thinking about. On the on the structural aspects, I've got two other structural engineers here. <clears throat> on the structural aspects, one of the things that we always make sure OSHA requires four anchor bolts per call, and we try to locate those 
as far apart as we can to get the column stability as great as it can be. And uh, then we also, if you've got a multi-story building, you raise that column splice up high enough that you can put a guardrail around the thing and attach it to the columns instead of trying to, in the old days, we used to splice a column like a foot above the deck, and now the contractor had to erect the fence. <coughs> yeah. Now we, we splice them four foot above the floor level. Uh, other things, uh, now they require, you can't have a loose beam connection. So you end up having to put connections where one side of the girder has, say, three bolts, and the other side of the girder has four. So that you can make two bolts on one side and never cut that beam loose in order to make the other connection. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff that's kind of behind the scenes, mm -hmm. but we do have to follow the OSHA route requirements for construction or rectability? Uh, for us, it's new, as in last month we started it. <laughs> but uh, we're doing constructability studies with our construction phase folks. So our guys who actually go out on the projects after we design it and they inspect everything. They'll actually go through all the plans once, and then I go through the plans once to identify confined spaces, trenching depths, things like that. We don't share it precisely with the contractor. It's so our guy on the ground knows <clears throat> what depths, where they need protection, what they need to look for on that project if we need a four gas meter. And I can plan that ahead. And then I can identify high hazard construction projects that I need to go visit a couple times, whether it's Montana, wherever it is, so it kind of gives me a pecking order of where to go and what to look at. And we've done three already, and it's going to be helpful. And let's goes back to that conversation with the PM and our guy on the ground. Of, Here's our construction study of what we need to look at and what we need on this project. Uh, and we also put in there what they can tell the contractor if they're not doing something. Uh, we also will put questions together for the pre-con on that project for our guys to ask if they're not covering it mm -hmm. when they're sitting there with the general contractor. So our guys can start spurring that information and figuring out what's going on or what their plan is. Uh, we did one at the beginning of the year. We showed up at the site. We said it was a confined space. It was 700 foot of culvert on the road, pitch black inside. Uh, talk to the construction, the general contractor, everything understood, they'll do supplied air, they'll test, do all this stuff. We showed up on site and the foreman had no idea what they were talking about. So we had to pull them back in. Again, we can't tell them how to do it, so we had to get them to meet back with their people to figure out how they were going to provide all the stuff they agreed to. But it's helping us have those conversations and for us, the main thing is we report to the owner. The general contractor reports to the owner. So a lot of stuff we work through, we work for that owner and the general contractor. That makes a lot of sense. I'm not supposed to answer questions, but I just thought about another aspect of that question. So not necessarily thinking about safety during construction, but thinking about safety down the road when it, after it's built, while it's being maintained. I know from in our, in my world, my industry, we especially like around fire pumps, uh, whenever we lay out those systems, one of the things that I will specifically go back and look for is how do you gain access to the various parts and components around that pump that you're gonna need, you know, is the valve eight feet off the floor, or is the valve six feet off the floor, or four feet off the floor? Do you have to climb over two pumps to get to the third one? Or do you have to climb over two or three pipes to get to a valve? And try to consciously 
lay out those pump rooms to take those things <coughs> into consideration. Uh, I also know that on a lot of our military work, uh, they're very conscientious about being able to access parts and pieces uh, that they know they're going to have to maintain over time. So on aircraft tankers, all the moving parts of the aircraft tanker door, they have to build designing catwalks and access paths and uh, so all of those components definitely play in from, from my perspective. The things that you don't necessarily think about until you've been the one to try to get over the bumps and <laughs> to the valve that's nine feet off the floor and right. over in that corner. And, uh, oh good. Are there things that, or how can the things that a design professional says while on site impact construction safety and or liability? Is there, is there anything that this group knows of? Well, when we have, um, when we have people, you know, like construction managers, construction inspectors on site, um, Again, I, I keep drawing from the projects I'm used to being on that or regularly on, and that's railroad projects. We always, you know, first time, first thing in the morning, we we have a job briefing to go over that day's activities, go over the protection. And if you're an active participant in that meeting, and, and we encourage our people to be active participants, you know, have, already have a safety moment that you're think, going to think about, or, you know, not think about, already have a safety moment in mind that you're going to talk about that could you know be a general safety topic it could be something that is applicable to the job but it just gets everyone you know thinking in that safety mind frame from the beginning of the day which kind of sends <coughs> the safety culture through everyone's work throughout the whole day and that's something that we've been really encouraging our people to be you know active eyes and ears of um, setting that tone from that first meeting of the day. And then, again, if they see something that um, that doesn't quite look right, you know, maybe go to the superintendent and say, you know, I'm not sure, you, you know, I think someone already mentioned that, you know, we really can't direct the means and methods of how things are done. But if something doesn't look right, I mean, we, we should, you know, say something about it. And if there's something like catastrophic, in danger, definitely stop. Let's just wait. Let's think and talk about what we're going to do or what we're doing right now. One thing I just thought of, <clears throat> on heavy industrial, we always uh, try to get guardrails on roof edges uh, in the des design phase. And uh, that way, when the owner maintains a rooftop unit. He doesn't have a situation where he can't be tied off when he goes up a ladder on the outside of a building. <clears throat> so we had an unusual project. And that project, we designed it for the OSHA regs. And the OSHA regs are great. And we get a call from the owner a couple of years later and he said, well, the Department of Labor showed up and says our roof edge protection doesn't meet the Department of Labor requirements. And sure enough, we looked in the Department of Labor, and they have a separate safety requirement that's different from OSHA. And it was a couple feet different. But and I was kind of like, gosh, guys. And under the previous administration, they were sending out the DOL inspectors and the OSHA inspectors to the same places and finding them differently. So, uh, I think that has stopped, but I'm not sure. That was an odd tweak. So, for our experience, it's, I said it's changed. You know, when I was at KDOT, it was write a contract and put the general contractor is responsible for all safety, blah, blah, blah. That's where 
we left it and we never looked back. Uh, we have all that in our information now, but where we found out we get in trouble with OSHA now is, one is if we actually step out and say, you need to get out of the hole, you need to fix it this way, we, we actually direct them how to do something. Then if something happens, OSHA's gonna bring you right in for the multi-employer and find you. The uh, thing that got us on the last time was communication between us and the owner and that documentation. So did you ever see them? in a trench. So all the trenches were seven and a half feet and deeper because water line seven and a half foot minimum. So we already know they have to have ladders, they have to have boxes. So did you guys ever see that? Yes. Show us. Well, they never documented it. Did you talk to the owner? No. Did you talk to the general contractor? Yes. Show us. Well, if you can't show them, it's going to happen. So that's where we're really trying to get our guys who go out on field jobs to know what to do, what to say, what to document. And they even drive a, a distinction between our construction phase folks and if you have a PE behind your name or if you have a CSP. If you're out there and you see something, then that's a whole different world of what you need to address and how you address it. So that's the kind of things we're dealing with right now. And, the liability side. And is that a matter of you you need to document everything that you see that's right and wrong? Yep. Or you you if, if you don't say something then it's an issue or you do say something that's an issue or our, if your guy questions it and says something, he needs to document it. Yeah, documentation's been becoming more and more uh, an emphasis with us too, just not only with seeing things and just everything that we do, go ahead and document. Because if you don't document it, something happens, you don't have proof, well, then you can't say you did it. <laughs> what about, and I can't think of, I can't remember all the details of the story that was told when, when the ACC board was talking about this topic, but uh, what about, say, design changes in the field or contractor wants to do something different and you're there and you say, yeah, that looks fine. And then a day later, whatever they were working on falls down and hurts somebody. Is that, I mean, my, my thought would be that that's probably not a good plan <laughs> to, to just say, yeah, that looks fine without having all the engineering background behind it. We've had, we've had that same discussion with our same people that it's not just safety, it's they ask you to alter design or anything. It, I can re our answer is we can recommend to the owner because basically we're there representing the owner. So if they want to change something, we're trying to get them to the point where we recommend, we'll recommend that to the owner and we'll let you know. So nothing's going to happen on our end in the field. So if they decide to change it, again, document yeah. right. the whole conversation. So OSHA comes in, they're, they're, they're going on everything you got. Yeah, a lot of times, I mean, design changes in the field, that just makes sense that you, you would at least um, absolutely notify the owner that something's going to change, be their buy-in that it's going to happen. But then, of course, the owner's going to want that design professional who designed it in the first place to go over it, review it, and make sure that everything looks all right. So I know in, in uh, at least my my thought is that in, especially in the industrial world and probably other places, there's a lot of times when you'll encounter owners that, you know, we've got to get it done right now. We've got three weeks to get this piece installed. And if it goes over three weeks, then that's, costing me money and if you have to install that scaffolding and put up whatever safety features then that's going to take longer and it's not going to work out and how do you do you have any recommendations on how to deal with those conversations or any pointers on things that have worked for for you in the past on convincing an owner that it may not it's not worth the risk to 
meet the schedule? Or I, I always believe that if 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 the number one responsibility, if the owner is backing you from the beginning, that the number one responsibility is to have a work safe work place, then and you bring that up and you make that point, then the owner nine times out of ten will back you and allow for that schedule slip. Um, we, I mean, we, we need to keep emphasizing that, that the most important thing is the safety of our people, of our workers, of, um, and, and uh, you know, nothing should, you know, shortcutting anything should, should you know, overrule that or take priority over that. And generally, I mean, and, and I can't think of an instance in which they haven't been agreeable to that that they said, that, yeah, let's, let's, let's take the time to do this right and put the scaffolding up correctly or get the correct training or bring in the right equipment, whatever the case it may be, and take that couple of days extra. And usually they should sign off. Um, usually they will sign off, you know, realizing all that uh, without any penalties or anything like that. Life. <clears throat> I found it on the heavier industrial side, I found the contractors didn't ask for stuff that would cause a uh, schedule improvement that were deemed risky. But on the lighter side of things, the commercial buildings, that's not uncommon. So. I'm less worried on that side of the fence than the other side. And, you know, get some guys that are pretty small operators out there, and they tend to, shouldn't say this, but I saw a uh, guy uh, putting up bar joist on the roof of the building with a ductwork uh, jack. Oh, it's like, dude, that stuff is not rated for that. <laughs> and you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and for us, we, again, pass that to the owner, make sure you document it. Like I said, believe it or not, OSHA is going to ask you for your your pay schedule because typically that's the first thing that contractor once they get a fine they're going to say is you rushed them you wouldn't let them do this you wouldn't let them do that so make sure it's documented and you have you have the conversation the owner agreed and the other side is if they say you rushed them but there's no penalties on pay for the job it's kind of hard to prove you're rushing them when you've already documented you asked for more time you got more time and all the pay allotments are on schedule. From a pre-qualifications perspective, um, I know those are pretty big in the, the contracting side, and, and I know at least with our company, um, some of them have been surprising to others in my office about, you know, why are they asking that question? Was that for an engineering company? Why are they? What's EMR? What's I, you know, what's IR, what's DART, what's, and uh, so what are, what are some of the things that, a couple questions and I'll go ahead and ask them both. So what are some of the things that engineering firms need to know about the pre-qualification process when, um, well, I've got three questions and I'll ask them all. <laughs> uh, we can take our thing. What do you need to know? As, a, as an engineering company about that whole process and, and how those ratings can impact your future partnership and, and work if you're a, say you're a small engineering firm and, and have one accident, how does that impact you versus a, a gigantic firm with one accident? Uh, other questions are if you're a design firm hiring a subcontractor, what do you need to be thinking about from a pre-qualification? And then if you're a contractor hiring
hiring the design firm, is there anything in particular or special they should be thinking about? There's um there's quite a few questions. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that, that's fine. Um, but but they're all related and and uh, you know um, engineering firms just like contractors we, we have our EMR we have our you know our our other um, KPIs like our DART our, our time recorded away and stuff like that and so um, I would say you know who knows that besides the safety officers and and, and the corporate safety and probably. In a consulting firm, I would say probably not too many people, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, but there are a number of industries in which it's very important, like railroad industry, the oil and gas industry, um, a lot of the power, big power companies. They're asking, they're asking for all that information, and so um, you know uh, the consulting firms they, they need to realize that those those numbers are important and. And, and, he, and, and they need to know, you know, what goes into those. I mean, every recordable OSHA incident, you know, goes into that. Every fatality, obviously, and, and, your, um, and those all, um, all go into those numbers. And, and then all the, you know, all the injuries and other miscellaneous things. That's all a reflection of your safety culture, which we're, we're you, know, you know, we're trying to improve all the time. Um, and when we're hiring uh, consultants, we want that same expectation from them. And a lot of times they're like, what are you asking? Uh, and, well, these are what our clients are expecting us, what the owners are expecting us to have. So we want you to have the same standard that you know, they're holding us to. And, then, and we do go into our um, a number of design build partnerships. So we do a number of those. We've been in a couple big design build partnerships, and and uh, it's the same thing. We want our partners to have those good safety numbers also. So our project managers, and, and we're trying to educate them the best that we can of what to look for, what numbers, you know, to uh, that what they need to be below or should be below. Otherwise, we need to have that talk. We need to have that discussion about. Okay, is this number on the rise or is it on the decline? And what uh, what have you put put into place the last six months to maybe improve your EMR and, and your other things? <coughs> Brought up the EMR. EMR in consulting firms is rather low. They don't record paper cuts as as a recordable incident. So when you do have a serious blunder, it stays with you a long time. And like you were saying, those industrial clients, the heavy industrial, expect you to have one of the better EMRs for that particular industry that you're in. Otherwise, and, you can't propose the project. Exactly. So it's, it's important, very important. And we, we divide, or we used to, firm divided people and their levels in the company with different requirements of training. For instance, a, a secretary would only require lifting and uh, electrical outlet type stuff and that kind of stuff. A little bit of training, but not a lot. Uh, but uh, we may have a PM that is going to be out in the field a lot, or a surveyor, they need a lot of training. And so we just had, for different personnel, we had different levels of mandatory training that they had to keep current. And that was, you know, there's great services out there now. Uh, that will let you do it online. They keep track of whether your training is up to date, and it's relatively inexpensive. And uh, that's what we used. You went through a slideshow on the computer, answered questions, and you had to get a score above seventy percent or something. And 
you would get an alert that this part of your safety training is due uh, in the next month. And so you went back and recertified the next month through your safety training. I like the alerts because yeah. sometimes those are easy to lapse, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like... Exactly. I mean, it, that's kind of not one of the things we're looking to. We're looking to get a project out right. and constructed, and we're not paying attention to that kind of paperwork. And it, it really was beneficial to have these alerts. And then you signed into this can't remember the name of the firm, but there's like four or five of them out there. Some university. And uh, so they just keep track. And when you have a new employee, you put them into the system. And when you have an employee leave, you take them out of the system. And it, it does work amazingly smooth. You talk about training, are you talking about like an OSHA 10 hour, or OSHA 30 hour, or is it more pointed? Or do you even know those terms? For, for us, well, for us, um, generally it's more pointed, and, and a lot of times it's a, like awareness training. We, we want, um, and we want all of our field staff who are on the, in the field for, you know, through the duration of the project of OSHA 30 hour. Okay. A lot of our PMs are there, you know, every once in a while, or our engineers or design staff, we encourage OSHA 10 hour, which, you know, is more of an awareness training. At least, if they see something that doesn't look right, oh, okay, maybe we need to look into that a little more and I need to ask somebody. So, we, we do like, um, we do utilize OSHA 10 hour, OSHA 30 hour, as well as our own <coughs> internal training programs. Do you ever get in, on the computer on the OSHA website and look up the emphasis programs? Emphasis yeah. programs. I have not. Yeah. That's some, yeah, That's a that's a good good site to look at because right now trenching and excavating is number one. If they see a, a trench, yes. if they mandatory, they pull over. So North, North Dakota, OSHA stopped at 197 trenches last year. And yeah. Find well, all of them. In Kansas, that's <laughs> that was right now. Right. So. Uh, that's a good one to go over. You know, if you get on there, it's really easy to get on there and look at it. And like I said, it's mandatory they stop if they see it. So I, I teach OSHA classes. So I can teach 10 and 30. Uh, I also use, as a KDOT, I now have three employees that work for Kansas Department of Labor, one that works for the city of Topeka. So I have those resources I can pull, get the new information for the trenching emphasis. Probably the biggest thing we did is for an engineering firm with our construction phase and our survey, we did have quite a bit. Our actual injury rate was twice the allowable rate. And mainly it came from, we take surveyors from Bismarck and send them to Louisiana, but they don't know what poison ivy is. They don't know what poison sumac is, so they're going through the brush and they're in the hospital getting shots because of that. So a lot of it was communication with everyone, knowing where everything is regionally. The other thing we really talked to them about is our EMR rate and our actual dart rate and our injury rate and what that meant to the bottom line. So, you know, the last couple of years for engineering, kind of been a downturn, so if it's hard to get projects and you're not even able to bid on a project because where our injury rate's too high, what can we do to stop that? So a lot of it was spent with those guys going over, here's our injuries, this is what a shoulder sprain costs the company, how that affects our work comp insurance, how that affects the EMR, and then at the bottom line, how that affects your project. So we did a project and we were going to survey and it had $30,000 sitting there of profit and we have two injuries on it. We didn't make any money or we lost money. How much, how much work do we actually have to have now to replace the funds we lost because of that happening? And 
since we started having those talks with everyone, and we did it from secretaries to PMs to the lowest person we had, our injury rates came down. And it's just more the knowledge of them knowing this is how it affects us. Also, Barbara West is employee owned, so at the end of the year, that affects everyone, bottom line. So it's, once we start getting that message across, you know, now we're at our three year average is just under an engineering firm's required amount. And we have 50 clients that we give that information to annually. I mean, we had, we had a, one client we tried to work with, we actually had an engineer who worked with 10 people from this group. They all had work for them. And they came out and said you had to be 60% of your injury rate. And for an engineering firm with 400 people, that's one accident. That's secretary getting out of the car in North Dakota and slipping on the sidewalk. Had nothing to do with anything you actually do in the fields. That's where you get hit at. So that's why we had to bring the secretary. Let all of them know this is what's going on. I think once once we did that, it helped. We also have an LMS system we installed with uh, our HR department, which we house all of our own training dates, even if we have a secondary source giving it. We still have the dates. And I think they get five emails prior to it expiring. So even on the rail, our e-rail, BNSF contractor, all that's, they'll get five warnings before they expire. So that's really helped us keep those certifications up. Uh, keep those guys actually interested. The other thing we did was we tried to get everything set up so they did it at the first of the year. Before I got there, it was all over the place. I mean, when they took it, they just, so we're like, first two months, usually slower, let's all take it this time. So that helped us make sure we had that. Uh, the OSHA 10 hour, I really tried to, you have to use OSHA's material, but you can pinpoint it to your projects. So you can instruct it for what they're doing. You know, there's some things you gotta cover that we never do, but on the other hand, there's a lot of things we can cover down to, this is how we need to do this, this is how we need to do this operation. You know, you're doing a density meter, you know, we went as far as you're in the hole, you need to actually walk to the end, walk up the ladder, and not try to throw the thing up over the trench and throw your shoulder out. So more, more spot on on what they're doing in the field to try to get them interested, engaged. And once you do that, they have stories. I mean, they've seen, you get to North Dakota, they've seen it all up there. I mean, they're still wild, wild west, so. <laughs> Are there any things that if, if you guys are hiring subconsultants or subcontractors under you that you look for in particular? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, other than the numbers, I mean, there's, uh, we're also looking, sometimes we, uh, we ask our clients, you know, we ask their opinions sometimes, um, you know, is there anything that you would think, you know, say about, this subcontractor, this subconsultant about their safety record because sometimes that speaks more than the numbers themselves. If, if you're, you know, putting in a proposal or, or um, in which you need to have a subconsultant or subcontractor, you know, included in your proposal, and um, the the client themselves, whoever you're proposing to, may already have a pre um, pre receive a notion of what their safety culture is like, regardless of what numbers are publishing. So that's that's something that we keep kind of keep a read on. You know, not not necessarily asking directly, but maybe just bringing it up in casual conversation, or if you're in a meeting with them, or having lunch, or something like that. That's something a little extra. And you know, of course, you know we're we're going to sit down and and uh, if. We notice that their EMR, their their any of their indicators.
indicators are on the rise from what they you know, sent us before, we're, we're going to ask the question. It's like, okay, what's going on here? Because sometimes it, it could be a very logical situation. And, and, and like Kelly said, if you're not that big of a firm, you could have a recorded portable incident for basically any prescribed medicine that you get at a at an ER if you go to the ER. So um, it, there's usually more to the story. Typically if you look at the EMR rate versus their injury rate, it'll tell you the story. And if their injury rate is high but their EMR is real low, that means their injuries have been, you know, small prescription, just minor things here. They could have a good injury rate, but their EMR is twice, you know, over one, you know something's happened. They, right. They've had a serious injury yeah. happen with that firm. Have any of you had the experience uh, with your with your firms of, you know, not only requiring this information about safety, but actually writing into the specification disqualifications if on certain, certain thresholds? Something that we've, we're asking our, you know, people who are proposing on projects that we're teaming with and are well, actually writing the, it in. Or the contractors when they're, when they're bidding the work and they're, they're sub the information they submit. I believe a lot of times the, I'm trying to think where I've seen this, but um, to answer your question, yes, I, I, I have seen where the, the owner's um, qualifications has that in writing. You know, a certain like the EMR under one. Um, you know, certain indicators like that. Oil, gas, rail, mm -hmm. uh, all refineries. Any of them, they're going to require that of anyone who steps on it. So, any of those projects are good on it. Say the most exposed you get is DOT work, government work. They they don't really ask for those numbers. So I think for us, what I try to do is if we have a if we have a contract with North Dakota DOT, we'll look up which contract we get, and you can go into OSHA and they'll tell you if they've had issues with reportable issues with inspections, and we get that information to get to our guy who's going to be on the ground. And this is what you need to watch for. We actually had that happen with. Uh, Construction company worked with. They had five fatalities in five years. I think there was a Minnesota, so was, keep your eyes glued. And I showed up on site, and you could tell OSHA had been there because everything was perfect. And you name it, it was up, <laughs> labeled, and done. So. Well, I had a whole other card of questions, but we're at our hour. Uh, if anybody. Does anybody else have any closing questions? I, I appreciate everyone attending. I uh, appreciate the panel. Uh, I know that I'm happy to continue talking with anyone. And, um, if you want to learn more about AZ Easy, go to our website. Uh, I really appreciate you guys being here and your participation as well. <laughs>